But yeah, I guess we can just pass it around for introductions. Yeah, okay. Oh, or, or, uh, welcome to Talking Underwater. One water, one, one podcast. podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. We can get it all in sync. Should we scream it at the top? That, that, was, that was the intention of the one water, one podcast thing, was to do it, say it all at once, but doing it on the internet, everyone does it at different times because there's lag. Yeah. And so it's just like it doesn't work online when right. you try and record it. Okay. <laughs> I've tried to like have us each do it independently and yeah. then to sync them all up and it is it the cadence is probably way off. Yeah, the cadence is terrible and it's it sounds demonic. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like not not a good <laughs> it's not a it's not good online. But it works better in person because we can all say it at the same time and it sounds more natural. So um, Welcome to Talking Underwater. One water, one, one podcast. podcast. I'm Mandy Crispin, editor in chief of Waterworld. I am Alex Cawson, associate editor for the Water Group. And I'm Bob Crossan. I'm the editorial director for the Endeavor Business Media Water Group. And we're here at WEF Tech 2024 in New Orleans. And we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we saw, some of our key takeaways. And then we also have some audience questions that we're going to be talking about at the end of the show. So first things first, I wanted to kind of mention that the PFAS equation is still evolving here at the show. I talked to a couple of different people about this, and I actually had a conversation this morning that was really fascinating about supercritical water oxidation. So one of the things that 374 Water is doing, they have, a, they have this technology. They're, they've got it in place in Orlando, and then over the next couple of months, they're going to be doing a lot of tests and running the destruction side of things to understand with PFAS-laden GAC media or PFAS-laden IX resin or foam fractionation, when it comes to the destruction side of it, how does supercritical water oxidation work with those from a destruction standpoint? And then also, they're going to be capturing a lot of the emissions data because that's one of the concerns that they hear outside of the water arena is, cool, we can incinerate this stuff, but does it go into the air and then it creates another problem because then it's floating down and it can impact communities in much wider arenas. So um, they're working to get a lot of that data, that monitoring information. They're also working with EPA to share that information and develop methods for testing and monitoring all of those things. So that was a very fascinating conversation. And then the other thing that's kind of been bubbling beneath the surface, a problem that everyone has known about for like 50 years is microplastics. And it just feels like now it's starting to become a bigger conversation. People are actually talking about it. Um, it's becoming a growing concern. And I know you, Mandy, you had a, an interview with somebody about microplastics earlier this week, if you wanted to share some thoughts on that. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I interviewed Gary Hunter yesterday. And if you want to see that video, you can go to waterworld.com slash videos. Um, and he was saying that if we can't even measure them, how can we even establish uh, treatment or remediation or any type of, you know, situation like that. So uh, check out that video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole thing is the, the, there's not even monitoring data. There's no UCMR for it like there are for the 29 PFAS and lithium, right? So getting a UCMR for microplastics and how do you define microplastics? Are they, uh, like what size are they? Are, what is a nanoplastic versus a microplastic? Are there, you know, are there things that are even smaller than that that we should be considering? And it's a very evolving field right now that doesn't have a lot of like concrete definitions it feels like and that's going to be i think the next step for everything but i wanted to share you i know you have also had a conversation with a couple folks yesterday it was really enlightening both of you it was quite a long conversation and a lot to distill but i'll let you uh take it away and share some of your thoughts from that as well Great. yeah so usually my takeaway from these shows is not a single conversation because we have a ton of conversations with many people uh, but i did talk to i had the pleasure of talking with uh, Mike McGill of Water PIO and Janice Slater. She's the general manager of West Morgan East Lawrence Water and Sewer Authority. Um, I got to talk to her about the LCRI, her lead service line inventory. Uh, inventories are due, everyone. Um, <laughs> and uh, about PFAS, she's been she's been on the front lines uh, since 2016 uh, with remediation of PFAS in her in her. Uh, in her utility. So we had, I think we talked for like an hour and a half. Um, my mind was absolutely blown. And that's the highlight of this whole show for me has 
in that conversation. So. Thanks, Mandy. So this is my third show now, and uh, I'm just staggered at the sheer size of this one. I don't think I've even walked to the far end yet. So that's that's one of my biggest takeaways. Um, another one, speaking of PFAS, um, on the collection side, Denora has a new product that is a vessel. Um, it uses either GAC, granular activated carbon, or ion exchange, and you can kind of like flip back and forth depending on application, um, size, flow rates, and stuff like that. Um, so that was a really interesting product, and um, I think that's a, it's going to be a useful technology. So. so thinking more about that conversation yesterday with Mike and everything, what, what were some of the, the key points of that conversation that you think would be interesting for folks to hear um, with us? I know that like the, the utility, J Janice, was very forward about some of the challenges that she's run into there, and I know Mike is a very like very outspoken about the communication side of things, so I'm wondering if there's a, a point that you took away from that that is like maybe the most critical that is still sticking with you now. Yeah, I'll start. Um, okay, so first of all, everyone is confused. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you're understanding what exactly your responsibilities are for your inventories. Um, and then communication is key. So uh, try not to be alarmist with your communications, but you need to be openly communicating and honest with your customers about what you need from them to move forward. Um, and then in terms of PFAS, the main thing I think Janice wants everyone to know, and I, I don't want to speak for her, but I think this is, would be accurate, um, is that it really depends on what your situation is when you're choosing your remediation uh, method. So you have to do the pilot testing. Don't just pick one and go with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh I think like the most staggering thing to me is just like how much work that the utilities have to go through. So it's like, first of all, hey, you know, do your lead service lines, like take inventory, you know, figure this stuff out, figure out where the lines are. And then, hey, here's PFAS, yeah. you know, figure this out. So it's just like they're kind of getting loaded up, you know, with things to figure out themselves. And then in Janice's case, uh, they have 40 employees, she said. Mm -hmm. And that's to cover uh, water treatment and wastewater, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. It's just kind of crazy to me that it's, they have to cover all this stuff with just mm -hmm. 40 people. And everything is an emergency. Everything's an emergency. Everything needs to be done right now. And right. Everything's on a timeline. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess the last thing I wanted to leave off with was the one water conversations I've had. That's been a bigger topic, I think, for a lot of the ones that I've had, uh, whether that's talking to uh, Howard Carter, the current president of WEF, he, he got the gavel on Tuesday, um, or uh, Susan Susan Moisio, the, our industry icon this year from Jacobs, who's the global water VP there. Um, she was very uh, talking about that a lot, too. And even here on the show floor, there's a, a water energy food nexus pavilion, which kind of reinforces that you know, we in our industry we talk about one water, the how we're segmented. I mean, we have Water World, Wastewater Digest, Stormwater Solutions. They're vertically oriented, but we try and do our best to like break down the silos between those. And that's not something that a lot of utilities are doing, or a lot of a lot of engineering firms have done in the past. It's kind of a newer idea to break down those silos. But when it comes to the water energy food nexus, it's also breaking down silos between business verticals entirely. So like we focus entirely on water, but you know. Water impacts ag, water impacts manufacturing, water impacts this entire food industrial complex. And thinking about water through that lens, like going even higher up, uh, higher up is a big part, I think, of where we're going to be talking about water in the next five to ten years is how, to, how are we going to make sure we're making the most out of, out of every drop of water that we're using? How does that impact, impact our food and our agriculture? I mean, our PFAS handbook just went out about the impacts even on the biosolid side in Maine. Like, you know, biosolids can't be land applied. That directly impacts all these farmers. And now that can't use that for... Um, they can't use that for the fertilizer and everything. It's cheap fertilizer, so where do they go for that? And it really just changes things dramatically when, when you're thinking about that. And I think it, that broadened the scope of thought that I had for One Water and us having a One, one Water podcast. I thought it was really worthwhile to mention that. But I guess we could talk about some of the questions that we have from, from our audience. You want to start those off, Mandy? <laughs> This is a silly one. A chicken walks through the door right now wearing a top hat. 
What does he say and why is he here? Well, I guess I'll, you know, I was just talking about the food industrial complex. Uh, might be, you know, with a, with a top hat, maybe he's wondering about the water quality in his bowl. <laughs> just a little, little, bit, uh, little bit water snobbish, perhaps, you know. <laughs> that was my thought, but. Yeah, I can read this one. All right. Uh, being in New Orleans in October, what was the spookiest thing that happened to you? I don't know if it's really spooky or not, but we went to a uh, church last night that was turned into a restaurant and apparently it was haunted. So we didn't experience anything too spooky, although our publisher did fall down the steps a little bit. Oh. And, he, and he blamed a, a ghost. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that was probably the spookiest thing. My hotel room smells like Axe body spray. That's creepy to me, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's another question on here, too, which is, after being at WevTech, where do you think the water industry is heading towards? And I think I kind of answered that with the one water mindset that I was talking about and a little bit with the PFAS si equation side of things, but do you guys have uh, any thoughts on that from your conversations that you've had? Yeah, I think it's going to be, um, I think the next big thing is going to be microplastics. So we're still de dealing with PFAS, we're still dealing with aging infrastructure, the sur silver tsunami, we're all of these things that are just emerging emergencies right now and are, you know, else lead and copper like all of these things are just emergencies and have they're on a deadline and now n next it's going to be microplastics i think so yeah i think going off of the silver tsunami just kind of like looking around and walking around the show it's it seems like it it's an older crowd i'd say um when i see like a younger person here it's kind of like they they stand out a little bit mm -hmm. so yeah well certainly um, this one's actually it will be kind of fun. If you had to choose one job position outside of the water industry, what would it be? And then a second question is, if you had to make a jump to a job inside the water industry, what would it be? Um, I'll go first. I think for inside the water industry, if it weren't the position I'm holding now, I probably would end up in marketing or communications somewhere. I think I'd probably be more fulfilled working in a communications role at a at a utility and sharing the stories of the people who work there and things like that. I, I'm really inspired by uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, for example, does a great work with its communications and um, being on a team like that would it looks like it's a ton of fun. It looks like it's a lot of work, but it also looks like super fulfilling, super fun work. So I think that that's probably what I would do if I were inside the industry, if I if I weren't in the role that I am now. Um, outside of the industry, that's a really good question. I, I'm a content creator a lot at heart. I've moved more into the director side of things, but I think if I maintain content creation, um, I don't know, that's a really good question. I was in news before, but I didn't find that it, it was... That was a, a very polarizing field, I think. Um, I don't know. I've been thinking lately, like, oh, it'd be kind of fun to write a novel. So <laughs> that's kind of what, one of my thoughts that I was thinking about. It'd be, that would get my creative juices flowing and things like that. So, Yeah, I have the same uh, answer that you had for inside the industry. Um, and then the same answer for outside the industry. So it seems like we're all in alignment here and in the correct roles that we're supposed to be in. <laughs> Um, and we are doing NaNoWriMo yeah. together as a group, so yes. we're going to be writing a novel soon as well. So look out for that. <laughs> <laughs> probably not water-related, though. <laughs> yeah, prob I mean, I'm sure there will be water references in there. Certainly. Yeah, um, yeah same, same for outside the industry, I think, like novel writing or something in that, that general area. Um, as far as inside the industry, I think a plant operator would be super cool. And it'd be learn. It'd be cool to learn like all the different like intricacies of the plant and how everything works. And I think it would be a huge challenge. Show so shout out to those people who are plant operators out there. Um, yeah. And I also think that they should invite the water group to do um, operations challenge. <laughs> if you guys would do that. <laughs> We'd be dead last. <laughs> we, it'd be so there'd be so many penalties to our score. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, if you had a time machine, would you go to the past or would you go to the future? Um, I 
am a big sci-fi fan. So I think I would probably go to the future. I would love to know if and when we have colonized the stars. Uh, I think it would be one of the coolest things. I know people, I know a lot of people are really scared about the dead of space, but it fascinates me. Growing up as a kid, I was like always intrigued by those stories of people who went into the Amazon and explored it or like people who charted maps around the world and stuff like that. And, you know, I grew up in an age where all these things had already occurred. We had full maps of everything, and there's not really much to explore on the surface of the planet so much when it came to that. And, uh, so I always gravitated toward the stars as like the next type of thing. And um, I guess fun little anecdote to add to that, that uh, when I th think back on my childhood, when we had our first computer, which was like a Packard Bell, it had like these encyclopedias on it. And as a kid, I was like, I don't know, seven, eight years old, I would print off pictures of nebulas and star systems and, and constellations and things. And I would paste them into like onto pages with like summaries about them. So like the fact that I'm working in magazines now, when I did that when I was like seven years old, is a really fascinating like full circle moment for me, even though it was something very different. So, um, Maybe that's a good good answer for what would I would do outside of the industry. I think something with, with physics and and whatnot, some engineering in that regard. I've always been fascinated with with NASA and everything. So maybe that's maybe that's actually the answer I should have for that instead of a novelist. But okay, I want to know if we're allowed to go more than once because what I would do is <laughs> I would go to the past first and. Uh, like give myself lottery numbers or something like that <laughs> so that I could set up generational wealth, right? <laughs> then I would go to the future and enjoy the fruits of my labor. Um, but really, I just want to go to the future to find out if we ever get the flying cars they promised us in Back to the Future in the 80s. <laughs> it, it was supposed to come already. It's 2024. Yeah, where, where are they? Where's my hoverboard? Tesla, get it together. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a really tough question because... It'd be fun to go back in time and kind of like see, you know, like what what the history is all about, like what happened then. But also, we don't we wouldn't have like any of the comforts that we have now. So like, I, I guess I'd have to default to the future just to see, you know, where we're at. I'd, I'd hate to copy your guys's answers, but <laughs> that's that's kind of where I am. Well, I I I think there are a lot of people who would enjoy going to the past and seeing things that were there. Um, but yeah, I am such a forward-looking person more so than I am looking back. So it just vibes with me. Um, this one is going to be a little more challenging, and I might be the one who answers this probably the most. But which is how has BABA affected manufacturers of small, relatively inexpensive components of water and wastewater systems? So. This is really fascinating because it comes down to a couple of different things. So it depends on what category in BABA their product falls into. So if that category is, is a manufactured product, that changes the equation entirely. If it's a construction material, then it depends on what type of material it is that, that will change the equation there. And then the only other thing is iron and steel products, which are more of like your valves, your pumps, your things like that, that, that go in there. The change with that, though, is that when, when you have an actuator on it, now the actuator is, com is compiled with it as well. When I think of small, relatively inexpensive components, there is a de minimis waiver that, that's applied to it. I believe it's 5% of the total cost of it's either the product or the project. I can't remember exactly which one that is. So if you're relatively small, depending on the cost you might have it be nullified entirely but if you're if you're putting together bigger products that are a little more expensive that's where i think it would come into play more and really it's more less about the size of the company and more about where you're manufacturing it, it, it's about are you manufacturing and pouring the iron and steel in the United States, or is that happening overseas and it's being shipped here and being assembled? Because if it's shipped here and being assembled, that's where like those things don't get counted in the BABA calculation. It's only the the the, the pouring side of things. So it's a tough that's a tough question to answer. I don't have a really good answer for it. But my experience and the people I talk to, it's more has to do with those outside manufacturing outside of the United States, like manufacturing pre predominantly in Europe, where there's a lot of innovation in the water wastewater market, and then trying to bring that here and, and put that into projects. Keep in mind also that 
when you think about BABA, BABA is a compliance thing for specifically for when federal dollars are used. So if you're just using a CD or a bond or other traditional financing methods that aren't tapping into federal grants or federal funding of any sort, then it's kind of moot anyway. It, it really is only focused on the, that federal funding. So I don't know if either of you have anything to add to that, but that's all. That's kind of all I was thinking could I would ha have on that. So all right, last question here. Oh, good grief! This is really. Would you rather? This is a classic Reddit question. Um, would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? And I, I am of the opinion that a hundred duck-sized horses is a swarm. Alex and I have been talking. He's reading uh, the first book in the, in the Halo series. He's played Halo. We've talked about Halo a lot. And when I think about a hundred duck-sized horses, I think of the flood from Halo. And I think about how terrifying and impossible it felt at times to fight them. And I'm like, you know, one brute you might be able to outrun or hide from. It's hi hard to hide from a hundred little guys down there even if you're just kicking them and stuff like that <laughs> i guess their bones would break pretty easily like horses bones break relatively easily right so like That's a low blow. <laughs> so maybe maybe you can get around that but i don't know i've always gone for the 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 larger the larger entity because you only have one thing to deal with as opposed to a hundred mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna go yeah with the with the horse sized duck as well um because i think what you could just do is throw bread at it Right? <laughs> right? Like, yeah. you could just throw bread, and it would get distracted because it would be eating. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So then you don't have to kill anything, Bob. True. I mean, how vicious is the horse? <laughs> how, vicious is, are, how vicious are the horses? How vicious are the ducks? Right. I'm going to go the opposite of you, Bob, because I think if you've seen an angry duck before, it'll chase you down, and then you, you magnify that to the size of a horse, and that is just frightening. That's like a, a dinosaur-level animal it's like a raptor it's like a t-rex it's frightening to me okay. so i i'd rather i yeah <laughs> well now we know who the who the expert on ducks is it's alex <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's our last question. So uh, thank you so much for sitting through us, <laughs> sitting through those with, uh, with you. Uh, well, I hope that you, you found something interesting from this. And we, we, we really found some interesting things at the show floor here at WebTech this year. And we hope that you've enjoyed our conversation of our, our experiences. And um, I want to make sure to check out our video, our description down below. We will have some links to some of the things that we've published about the show down there, as well as some links to some of the videos that we've done. And make sure to check all of our websites. So that's why waterworld.com, wwdmag.com and stormwater.com. But for next time, we'll see you we'll see you when we see you. Thanks so much for listening.